to put this into our own personal perspective, if if you have a heart attack, that's going to rock you. That's going to, to shake you to the core. And for most people, that's going to cause them to want to do something about it, take action, make changes in their eating and exercise. The, the same thing is going on right now, not only in Florida Bay, but with the entire system, with these discharges and the problems that they're causing. Next year, things might be better. And we need to stay on top of this issue and say, we, we, you know, we're tracking the vital signs now of the Everglades. We have been for quite some time. We've got people's attention on this issue with red tide, with blue-green algae, with seagrass die off in Florida Bay. We need to maintain that attention and that commitment to change, even if things seem good next year or the next couple of years. We need to continue to educate and communicate that, yes, we're trending in a positive direction, but part of it might be just because we had the right amount of rainfall at the right time last year. And And we know the benefits that that gave us last year with the juvenile fish production in in many of the mangrove creeks around the Everglades. That's not a sign of success with restoration. That just means the system has resilience. And that if we stay on this path of restoration, we can have that nearly every year. I'm Captain Chris Whitman. This is Steve Davis with the Everglades Foundation. I'm Captain Benny Blanco, and this is the Tom Rowland Podcast. The weeks just keep ticking by, and every week we're uploading new stuff to waypointtv.com. Our new shows for 2019 are hitting Waypoint before the networks. Not only us, some other producers are doing the same thing, and more and more stuff is coming. So go to waypointtv.com, and you can find all of your best favorite hunting and fishing content, plus so much more. There's podcasts now. Waypoint TV has the Waypoint Collective Podcast Network, and lots of people are joining up over there, bringing together lots of voices of leadership, conservation, and fishing techniques, hunting techniques, all kinds of people are joining up. So make sure to check out that anywhere you find podcasts, Waypoint Collective. And also, they have some really cool social media that I've been looking at a lot, Waypoint TV dot fishing, waypoint TV dot boating, waypoint TV dot hunting, and the anchor site Waypoint TV on Instagram. Those are all on Instagram. All right. We have another great show about the water issue in Florida and all of our hopes and dreams and aspirations that the new governor is going to lead us to recovery. And, and so far, there have been some big steps taken thanks to the work of Captains for Clean Water, other organizations like the Everglades Foundation, and so many other people who have put in a tremendous amount of time and effort on this issue. Today, we have Captain Chris Whitman, one of the founders of Captains for Clean Water. We also have Captain Benny Blanco, who has been on the show before. And we also have Steve Davis from the Everglades Foundation. And it's really great to be sitting around a table with these guys who have so much more experience in this arena than I do. I was able to ask a lot of questions. I think they're going to be a lot of the same questions that you might have. So hopefully you will gain as much out of this conversation about the water issues in Florida and the new leadership in Florida and how that's all going to come together to really make a big, big difference in uh, in the recovery efforts for the Everglades. So there's so much hope right now. Everybody is positive and really full of hope that we are really making a difference. So I hope you'll enjoy this conversation with Steve Davis from the Everglades Foundation, Chris Whitman from Captains for Clean Water, and Captain Benny Blanco. So we're sitting here at Hawks K, and I appreciate you guys uh, spending spending an hour or so with us. I'm really looking forward to uh, to talking about what's going on with the Everglades because we've got a lot of really exciting things. We've got new leadership in in the state of of Florida, and I really want to talk about what that means to us as 
people who love the Everglades. So with me, I have Steve Davis from the Everglades Foundation. I have Benny Blanco, which we've done a podcast with him before. And I have Chris Whitman, who is, who is um, uh, one of the founders of Captains for Clean Water. So um, just I'd like to get kind of your, your story a little bit so people know who we're talking to. And um, Steve, what, what brings you to Hawks K this weekend? Well, I'm uh, an ecologist with the Everglades Foundation. I've been working for the foundation for almost 10 years now. Uh, I come at this um, sort of arena with an academic science background. I started working as a graduate student in Florida Bay in 1995, uh, and that was on the heels of a a pretty massive seagrass die-off. And so my project was sort of developed around that thinking of Everglades restoration, understanding that the bay needs more freshwater flow. So I was on an academic career path. I was a professor at Texas A&M University for uh, about 10 years, uh, still doing Everglades science, but also focusing on coastal water issues in the state of Texas, looking at environmental flow recommendations for estuaries and trying to understand the habitats along the Texas coast. So that's interesting. When you first got started, was 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 the Everglades and and that direction a, a result of of the the problem you said you came right on the heels of it. So were you just kind of ushered over there or did you have an interest in that and and kind of moved in that direction yourself? I admittedly I was ignorant about the Everglades. I w- what I knew of the Everglades coming from Ohio was what <laughs> I saw in my grandfather's National Geographic yeah. magazines. Uh, to me, it was just this wild place that I had to see. And uh, to have an opportunity as a graduate student to come down and and work in the Everglades, I was willing to take any project that was available. Right. This was a project uh, that I stepped into funded by the South Florida Water Management District uh, when I was at Florida International University. So we had a number of colleagues on the project and colleagues that I still work with today in the water management district and at FIU that um, sort of we cut our teeth really on understanding the benefits of freshwater inflow to uh, Taylor Slough, Shark River Slough, Florida Bay. It's interesting because so much of, of what I have talked about so much in, in, in learning about this since I've, I've become more familiar with, with captains and the work that they've done, it, it ha- I've learned a lot more about the Caloosahatchee in my world uh, you know, we leave out of here right out of Hawks Keg and go to the Everglades. So the issues that we're having in the Everglades, uh, in my world, are different than the issues that you're having that are Everglades focused that are Caloosahatchee. I mean, one is too much water, another is not enough water. So I'm really interested in talking to you about that. Um, and then, so your career from from that point to today has has been what more Everglades have you gotten off of the Everglades and I, done other projects I, I'm or? entirely Everglades okay. I, I um I, I still uh, collaborate with scientists I still get to do a little bit of science in the field which is great so I'm publishing papers and uh, working with graduate students and uh, that that's really where the the new knowledge is generated so to be able to participate in that new knowledge generation as well as being able to engage different stakeholder groups elected officials to to educate them about why this is important it's a it's really a way of bridging the knowledge as it's being gained to the people that are actually making the decisions so it's it's been very rewarding and how long have you been with the Everglades Foundation? Yeah, it'll Sorry. be ten years. Okay, in, ten years in June. Cool. And um, and then we have Benny Blanco. Um, Hi, Tom. Good to see you. Been filming your show. I have. Good. Thanks for having good. me again. Yeah, we're looking forward to seeing your show. And and uh, you know, tell tell me about about the show because it is focused on on exactly what we're talking about here, right? I mean, that is the underlying theme of your show. It is the the only reason I agreed to do a show was that we were going to base it solely on the quality and the issues surrounding our water in the state of Florida. Um, it's not solely Everglades National Park. I, I, I wish it was, but the reality is our, we have to talk about the water quality issues in the state of Florida as a whole because it's not just Everglades suffering. We literally have every single fishery in the state of Florida is suffering from some water issue or another. And um, and my uh, my idea there was that if 
if we could expand the conversation outside of just the fishing industry, because the fishing, the fishermen know there's a water issue. Every guide worth his weight in salt understands there's a major problem um, in their fishery and the fisheries surrounding their fisheries. And um, but outside of that industry, there there is no real recognition that there's a problem. And I'll use ICAST as an example. Uh, two years ago, we were at ICAST and we were talking about the water issues. And um, we walked outside of the the the, uh, the convention center in Orlando. We found someone on the st- just street just walking by and asked them what they thought of the water issues in the state of Florida. And they said, well, we went, just came back from the beach and it was beautiful. And uh, so there is definitely an issue with just general knowledge of the problem. And so I agreed to do this show with the sole purpose of expanding that conversation. If we can take the conversation about our water issues and make it a household conversation, then we can see real change soon. Mm -hmm. And that's my whole concept. And so um, we are filming. Um, I'm leaning on the biggest voices in the industry uh, because people are going to get tired of hearing me talk about water (laughs) because they already are. Um, And um, and I'm going to rely on big voices to to explain the issues in their specific areas. And we're going to tell the stories of those areas so that people can understand that it's not just their issue, it's not just their area, that it's a state of Florida problem. And the sooner we get together to fix it, the sooner we can see actual change. That's great, man. Uh, education is huge. I, I think that, um, you know, that's one of the reasons why I like the podcast so much is because it, it allows for a much longer conversation. It allows for a much deeper dive into into things that that I'm not able to do on a 22-minute and 30-second show your show is different because that is the hundred percent focus of the of the show. So I wish you all the best with that because I think it's going to be um, very, very important in this fight for the Everglades. And then we have Chris. Good to be here, Tom. Thank you for being here. I've been wanting to do one with you for a long time. Uh, I was talking to Daniel Andrews not too long ago, and he showed me a picture that was taken three years ago. And uh, so this is. Three years ago today is some sort of anniversary for you guys, right? Yeah, it is. So it what is. does that uh, look like for the last three years in your life? <laughs> Basically, our our, our life uh, professionally has, has done a 180. You know, we went from fishing guides being on the water 300 days a year to, uh, to, to being on the water uh, a lot less and, and being in places like Tallahassee and Washington, D.C. and uh, other other meetings at, at water management districts and things like that a, a lot more than we would really prefer to be, but uh, but it's being effective and it's, it's needed. It's, it's, I think if you would have told Daniel or I, uh, either one of us three years ago, that we'd be doing what we're doing today versus, you know, what we – set out to do and had basically our, our dream job, we'd have told you you were crazy. Right. But, uh, you know, looking back on it, uh, we we're we're very happy to be where we are today and we're, we're, it's, it's very rewarding and satisfying. Well, you've made tremendous strides, um, really, really tremendous strides. And just, just recently, um, we have a new governor that has come in that, um, issued, an executive order, and that executive order was called the achievement or achieving more now for Florida's environment. And um, there's two point five billion dollars at stake here, or not at stake, but but towards this project. So, what do you what do we think this is going to look like for the for the everyday angler, for the person that 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 likes the Everglades, for the person that goes there once every five years? What what is this new uh, leadership? The new you know the, he he's asked for the resignation of the people on the water board. Um, it, it seems like a very positive time in this fight, uh, but I'd like to hear from all of the different perspectives of what what we think this means for for us. Yeah, I th- you know I think for for one thing, um, this is something that is. Uh, going to provide a lot of, or has provided a lot of inspiration and encouragement for not only the people who are involved and been involved trying to to fix these issues. Um, that hey, we are making progress and, and we're we're going to get this done, um, but also to hopefully get some some new people involved. You know, 
that's really the the key to this and that the the reason why big part of the reason why we haven't seen as much uh, progress as as we would like to see uh, was a, a lack of um, uh, the people need people who needed to be involved being involved people like myself and Daniel um, who you know as a fishing guide for 20 years all we weren't involved you know mm -hmm. and when you look back on that and the, the that's kind of crazy that yeah. um you know people the the industry and the culture and the people like us sitting at this table who are arguably some of the most directly impacted and affected weren't involved in in the effort to well, fix it uh, so that's a that's a really interesting thing i mean at some point you think well Maybe if I just ignore it, it'll go away, or you know, maybe it's maybe it's something that blows in and blows out. And then there's then there's also, well, what if I make a big deal about this? Does it affect my bookings? Does it affect my tourism as a fishing guide? Does it affect these other things? And I think that it, it, it at some point it gets to a point to where you have to bring it to light and have to speak about it very publicly because it's not going away. Right. And that's what you and Daniel did really is decide you know what, this is, this is not going away. It's go only going to get worse. And I think that the way that you guys went about it and, and, and Captains for Clean Water caught my interest, and I've said it many times before, because there was a very positive outlook. And it wasn't just screaming and shouting. It was, it was very positive. There is a solution. We're working our way towards this solution. And then there's an education process going into it, not only educating, um, you know, just the, the, the run of the mill Floridian or the person who comes down here every few years, but even the people that are making their living, like, like fishing guides right out of here, like what's going on up there right. and, and why is this a concern for you and why are you, why should you be concerned in the in the Florida Keys with what's going on with the Caloosahatchee River. Right. Because, and for a long time, I couldn't get my head around it. And talking with you and Daniel and and uh, really diving into this and understanding it better, I, I understand it better now. But there are two diametrically opposed problems. One is hypersalinity, and one is way too much fresh water with all kinds of nutrients in it. And, and they're causing different problems. But those problems are all connected and there is a solution that can fix both of them. And, and, and a lot of people just either have just stuck their head in the sand and just said, you know, it's not affecting me. I'm, I can fish the ocean side for a while, or I can do this, or I can do that, and it's not affecting me. And now I think that a lot of, I think the way that you guys have done it, and a lot of groups have done it, but I think that, I think that there has been a lot of education to realize what the problems in these other areas that are not attached to you and your livelihood and what you're doing, why that's important. That's the right. same thing for those guys up there to understand why it's important that, that, that snake bite, you know, is healthy. Right. Yeah. As, as far as that goes, you know, we, we have to get people in the mindset of thinking about this as one system, mm -hmm. um, not individual regional uh, symptoms that yeah, they may personally experience. It's really hard to do that when you own a restaurant that is that is not uh, doing very well because there's a fish kill on your beach. Right? Why do you care about what's going on in Flamingo? Right. Like it, it, you're you're hundreds of miles away. And, and I think you know, like you said, there there was a there in the, in the past. You know, I'm born and raised in the same town, guided there for for 20 years. There's been a, a there's kind of a multitude of reasons of why people like myself or just our communities in general haven't been as engaged in these issues as they should have been. Um, some of it uh, was that just the fear of, um, you know, the, the repercussions to their business. But a lot of it, and I think the majority of it was more so the, f the feeling of um, that th this is a, a, a problem so much bigger than me as a fishing guide or a hotel owner or a bartender, whatever your, your career is, um, c can affect, you know, what, what can I possibly do? I'm just a, a fishing guide. This is this, this huge thing. Um, and really th that feeling boiled down to, or stemmed from a lack of understanding of what the, the solutions were really. 
um, that that feeling is what caused Daniel and I to start Captains for Clean Water. I mean, when we were sitting there getting bombarded by discharges from Lake Okeechobee and watching not only our business uh, as a fishing guide suffer, but watching the entire economy of Southwest Florida, Florida suffer uh, because of that water quality, we, we really, at that point, realized that something needed to be done. We needed to get stakeholders that weren't involved involved. And um, we looked at ourselves to, to see why we hadn't been involved, hadn't been involved. You know, we started asking people uh, wherever we would go. You know, we're, if we were out to eat, we'd ask the server, or the bartender. If we were at a gas station, we'd ask the person at the gas pump next to us, hey, you know, these water issues that are affecting us here. Oh, yeah, you know, and, and the stuff that's visual, they see it. And you'd ask them, well, well why is that? What, what, do you know why that's happening or, or what needs to be done to fix it? And if you ask 10 different people, you get 10 different answers. And that really was what made us realize as individuals, there was something we could do to make a difference. Um, the more we started reaching out, uh, Daniel and I initially, to uh, respected scientists that we know, um, you know, one of the first people we called was Dr. Aaron Adams with Bonefish and Tarpon Trust. And, um, you know, we, we got to talk with people like Steve Davis with the foundation. And what we realized was there's plenty of science that, that, that says this is what needs to be done to fix this. And this is why these components of this one singular system are suffering, or this is why you're seeing these individual symptoms, the, the science exists, which is a really good thing because so many times when you're talking about ecological issues, it's a matter of needing more data and needing more science. And there's a huge gap there between collecting data, analyzing the science, and then making the decisions on what needs to be done to fix the problem. This is, we're in a fortunate situation. That's not the case here. The, the overwhelming science is known. The action is known. The solution is known. So really what it was was a, a fact of getting that knowledge, getting the science and the solutions that science supports into uh, and to, to the people, to the stakeholders. And by doing so, if we would do that, that we would be able to activate those stakeholders to be engaged in the fight to save these things. And, and that's that's literally why captain started and how it started as is just that gap to get the information that that people like steve have out to the people like me and you mm -hmm. and 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 the end and the purpose for doing so is is to get us engaged in the fight to save the everglades that's uh well you've done a really good job at it and steve in your opinion how how do you see like science and fishing guides or bird watching guides or kayak tours or people that are making their living, you know, in and around the the Everglades, the Caloosahatchee, the 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 fringes of the Everglades. How do you see that that these types of groups have worked together over the years to to advance to where we are today? I, I think it's been uh, uh, a relationship that. You know, you th you think about just nationally. Um, I, I I don't think that other areas have the same kind of relationship that we have in places like Florida Bay. Florida Bay is a unique system in that you don't have this massive population living around it, like you do, say, with the uh, the Caloosahatchee or St. Lucie, those areas where when the water comes from the lake and you see blue green algae, everybody sees it. In some cases, it's in your backyard. Right. When we have problems in Florida Bay, um, we don't have scientists on the water every single day. And while we have sensors scattered across the bay, we, we don't catch the changes as they're happening in real time. And it's the guides who are out there every day that because these relationships have been developed over decades, we have a, a, 
a conduit for say somebody saying, Hey, I, you know, sent me a picture. What the hell is this? Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, we've got nothing but acres of grass floating on the surface. Um, so I, I think because of our past and the impacts that Florida Bay has endured, um, we've been able to develop and foster those relationships over time. So when those relationships began, like in 1987, there was a really big die off, right? Was there a, a, a good line of communication then where, or, or, or are the scientists just kind of hearing rumblings and people kind of like, I don't know what this is. And there weren't cell phones back then. You couldn't get, you couldn't get somebody weren't, wasn't texting you at a photo saying, what the hell is this? How, how have you seen that, that, that relationship of, of one-to-one communication with the people that are actually out there like Benny every day, how has that changed from, you know, with the advent of technology and all of that? Oh my goodness. It's, it's been, um, just as monumental as the technology itself, because now, um, well, let's just rewind to the late eighties when this happened the first time and, and it wasn't an immediate phone call. Uh, it was because there were scientists working down here in the keys, spending a lot of their time on the bay, counting seagrass blades and poking holes and, and doing what seagrass scientists do. And, and it took, relationships that they had developed with a few flats guides to, to, you know, strike up a conversation to say something's going on out here. You know, I have a, a a description of it that I would like to share with you or some notes or maybe a photo. Uh, now I, I get text messages when somebody's on the water saying, I'm seeing all this drift algae out here. What, you know, I haven't seen it this bad before, or, so and so is pulling up some crab traps, and they're just loaded with barnacles. We hadn't seen this sort of density of barnacles before, and so now having that real time information, it's it's as valuable as being able to go to NOAA's website and pull up the salinity for Garfield Bite. It, it's it's incredibly impactful and helps us to stay on top of changes as they're occurring. Does it matter to scientists how this type of information is is acquired, like? You know, there's a scientific method to to create, you know, to to getting things, getting evidence of something happening. Does it matter, or is that, or are or, or scientists using like these photos that Benny or Chris or I would send you and saying, hmm, that's something we need to look in on, and then you're going to send a team there. Is that what goes on, or are people like, oh well, we know what that is now after all of these years. How do you, how does that work? That that's a great question, and it speaks to the value of qualitative information versus quantitative information. And you're right, as scientists, we like to have things very controlled, and and you know, with the use of statistics to be able to defend you know our conclusions about the observations that we make or that others make. Um, and so th- there are measures that would need to be taken in order for guides to be able to generate um, quantitative information that would be useful. And I, I personally think there's a great opportunity for that. And we've talked about it internally as a community by, um, you know, having guides who are on the water regularly to, you know, perhaps contribute to our body of quantitative information on water quality. I, I think there's a, a, a great opportunity, almost like an Uber-like model where right. you have these folks on the water every single day. If you could equip them with sensors and teach them how to use those sensors and to uh, to calibrate them and, and record and the it, information. Yeah, it's really about recording the information. Like it was exactly this time on exactly this day, you know, and these were the weather conditions because all of that plays into what you're seeing there. And, exactly. And and uh, I guess the Bonefish Tarpon Trust and other other organizations have used guides as for fish counts and uh, and other, other things. But I just kind of wonder, you know, is that – scientifically based collection like and and what you're saying is it could be it's not right now but it could be and and it doesn't necessarily have to be because sometimes the photos allow us to say okay Mm. maybe we need to focus our sampling in that area uh another example uh steve friedman uh with the florida keys guides association sent me a couple of pictures last year from his canal and the water was purple 
And he just, hey, Doc, what's going on out here? And, and as soon as I saw the pictures, I knew I had a really good sense of what was going on. And sure enough, it was uh, Hurricane Irma loaded a lot of organic matter. And, you know, with the storms, you get a lot of debris from the trees and sometimes construction materials. These canals fill up and that stuff degrades. It changes the quality of water and it feeds bacteria that actually can turn the water purple. So I really? was able to tell him what was going on just by looking at the photo. And, and it, it raised enough of uh, concern in the county that I was able to appear before the Monroe County Commission and brief them on some things that they might want to be looking out for in terms of very low oxygen levels in some of the canals. And sure enough, they were on top of it and they had been trying to acquire funds to clean out the canals. And that's obviously a, a lingering issue down here, but uh, it's, it's helpful. Yeah. Those canals, it's, it's interesting. I see, I see, you know, articles and stuff. They're pulling every manner of things out of the canals and, and some of which did not come from Irma, probably came from Wilma and, and even previous storms to that. And somebody might've just dumped a refrigerator in there at one point, you know, a long time ago, but they're getting a lot of that stuff out. And then I know that's been a, a big, um, a big, project lately um so i guess what i'd like to see and know from from this this group of people that has a tremendous amount of knowledge both from the scientific and from the real world actually being out there is is now that we have this change of of leadership with the new governor and it seems that he is placing this at a priority for i mean in the first 48 hours he did he he made some sweeping changes so what is it that that we all see around this table as the things that need to happen to make a difference in the Everglades? You know, I, th- I well, I think what we need to see happen to make a difference in the Everglades is more of what we've seen happen in the last year or two years or so. And that is an increase in the amount of people engaged in in water quality issues in Florida. And more so is an increase in the people who have not been engaged becoming engaged. Um, That's been the formula to make ultimately that led to the decisions of Governor DeSantis in in the past week. That, that was what made that happen. You know, if, if you look back at, look at the last 24 months and the, the amount and scale of, of new people becoming involved, um, putting this out there, making it a priority to them and their way of life and, and their business and um, the future of, of, of their way of life the, the, for their kids and their grandkids. That is what made water quality the top topic coming into an election season. You know, if you looked back years prior, it just it just wasn't one it wasn't something that the candidates had to run on or even acknowledge. It was about jobs or you know this or that, and and what it boils down to is the water quality, the health of our ecosystems affects our jobs right of course and so um that that kind of perfect storm of these these symptoms this this crisis of really really bad things happening to uh, our ecosystems if there was a silver lining in that it was that it it catapulted people um into this that had never been involved in it before and when the public in mass is is engaged. The politicians um, who are who are making the decisions, who are going to affect where Everglades restoration goes and the quality of our water goes, um, they have to pay attention. You know, it's it's when we the people are quiet that things lose track and don't get done. Um, I th- I think that's. That's really what what needs to happen going forward is just, is just scaling up what is what has happened in the last year or two. Um, I, I know, uh, you know, Benny can probably uh, testify to the to the fact that, as can you, we've seen more engagement out of 
the fishing industry yeah. and our culture as, as outdoorsmen than I can ever, ever think of seeing before as, as far well, the, as a whole, the, a the whole mullet big group. Nets, the mullet net, you know, when, when they, when they got rid of the mullet net and Florida sportsman was a huge part of, of that and leading the way there. And you did see a, a big, a big uniting of, of the voice and it was very, very effective. Um, and then they, they don't have those and it changed that changed the fishing in the state of Florida as much as, as anything. But I think, I think that it takes someone to lead the charge that people can, can put their trust behind. And I think that's what you and Daniel and captains for clean water have done a good job of, of look, man, we're just like you guys. And this is a problem and it is on our front doorstep. It may not be on yours, but these are these are the reasons why you need to be concerned about it, and I think that that has been a, a, a major part of why. Unfortunately, another major part of of why people are becoming more involved is because there's dead manatees and dead tarpon all over the beaches, all over Florida. That's no good. That all of a sudden gets people's attention, and they want to get more involved. But I really do believe that it's a leadership thing. Just like when you go back to the to the banning of the of the mullet nets, that it was a someone had to lead that charge. And, and in that case, Florida Sportsman was a big part of that. They had a voice. They had a tool that they could educate people on why this is a really important issue. And then once all of that's gone, you see a tremendous rebound in the number of redfish in the, in the Everglades. You see a tremendous rebound in the number of redfish throughout the entire state. And I think that was, you know, a, a really, really could go down in history as being one of the, one of the bigger conservation, uh, something that happened that actually moved the needle towards changing the fishery. Um, and I think that we are on the, on the cusp of that right now. Where an end result was achieved yes. basically. And it, in, you know, I think, um, you know, Benning can talk about it. A lot of it is, you know, that was, is using what platforms are available mm -hmm. to us to, to spread that. Look, you hit the nail on the head. It, you, you shouldn't have to be a fisherman in the Everglades to care about the Everglades. You know, I, I, I don't have to live in Alaska to care about pebble mine. Mm -hmm. I don't have to live in, you know, Wyoming to care about Yellowstone. Uh, it's, I think, I think that mindset comes very naturally to outdoorsmen. Um, you know, we want to see, we have a very good understanding and respect for the need of healthy ecosystems. Um, the, the, the role that we can play uh, as as fishermen and outdoorsmen is 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 really catapulting that outside to other audiences, mm -hmm. whether it's through TV shows like mm -hmm. yours, or you know, when you talk about the net ban, how Florida Sportsman was able to use their publication as as a big medium to spread that information. Today, here we are, not very far after that, we have things at our disposal with social media. You know, I mean, um, Benny. Uh, and and w with Florida Sportsman is is started a, a TV show specifically for that purpose to bring these issues um, into the living rooms of people who may not think that it's important to them. And hopefully, after uh, being exposed to that, um, that they, they realize that it is. And and I think as fishing guides, that's a big part of what we do. Right, we're, we're guides because we want to share what is special about our office with other people. And, and what happens is those people can come and spend a day in the Everglades with Benny and have a moment in, in that day that literally will, will hang with them for the rest of their life. And through that experience, they gain a love and respect for that place. And result of that is they want to be part in ensuring that that place is is protected for the future. How how have you seen that, Benny, with with your current clientele and what you're doing, and and you know, like Captains for Clean Water wasn't even around three years ago, right? Right. So in the in the course of the last thirty six months, as you become more involved, you're talking to your customers more on the boat. How have you seen that um, translate into those people giving their time, giving their money, giving their attention? giving their political clout or their social media accounts or whatever it may be. How have you seen that kind of translate? Well, 2015 was a, was a big year in transition for me because I, I went from being a guide in Everglades National Park to understanding there is a huge problem 
that we have to fix. And um, there was two ways to go in that in that respect. One was to put my head in the sand mm-hmm. and just continue guiding and working on my day to day because it's really easy from a guide's perspective. Guides don't make a lot of money, even if you're on the water every day. You don't make a lot of money. It's easy to get stuck in your day to day. You're worried about where the next charter is going to come from, wh- whether your next charter is going to catch fish, and it's easy to not look at the big picture. But the big picture is that a all of our fisheries are are attached, are connected. Uh, my fishery is not solely the one in trouble. Chris's is in trouble. Yours is in trouble. Daniel's is in trouble. And we're, it's one continuous fishery, uh, one continuous water issue, one sole problem that we have to fix. And and two that 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 the the we have to continue making it a priority because it's easy for politicians like they have for the last several decades to to not make it a priority. Um, and what we've what we've seen happen in the last three years is in that thirty six months is that we have all stood up, spoken up made it a priority for this election, for this new governor coming in. I mean, if we continue that path and make it, a, continuing to making it a priority, then we can see real change. Um, and so that's, 2015 was a big year for me as far as my life, my career, because again, I realized that it was something bigger than, than just, you know, an issue in my fishery. Um, and I chose the methodology of educating my clients uh, as I became educated, because again, I, I was just a fishing guy. Um, I became educated and I educated them. And what's amazing and and unexpected was that they've become the biggest advocates. They're members of every single organization that's been fighting for this. Not because I told them to, but because they want to know more. They want to get involved and they want to save that fishery that they love as much as we love. They don't want to hear me say one day, sorry, can't go to the glaze today because just there's no fish. That would be devastation for them. So um, it's, Going back to what I was saying about guides and it being easy to go to day to day, if if you get in that stuck in that day to day grind and you don't educate your clients and you're and you're of the methodology of not speaking about it because oh my god they may not come back, then then you you're you're being way too short sighted about what the issue is. Uh, it's an opportunity for you to educate someone who could potentially be a proponent, who could be a supporter, who could help us get to that next level, and um, that it's it, it, you have to look at every chance to educate a client or a neighbor or a community member or a family member there's an opportunity to to gain someone in the fight does that make sense yeah yeah it certainly does <clears throat> does anybody think that that as we make progress and things start to happen and you get leadership involved that as things start to happen that it becomes more challenging to get people involved because they think well, there are no more dead fish on the beach. You know, they're they're not releasing that water out of the river anymore. Um, does that become more difficult or more challenging than when there's an immediate? It seems like to me, it seems like you know, if you got red tide and people can't breathe when they go outside, and there's there's dead fish on the beach, you're getting that person involved. That's a that's sure. like the easiest sell there is. Yeah. But when things are good and making an improvement, we still need that that support. No, I think I think that's that's been a, a challenge all along. As long as people have been fighting for Everglades restoration, that's been one of the biggest hurdles. Is it's it's real easy for people to be engaged when the symptoms are in their face and they can't ignore it. Uh, it's when the symptoms go away, but the problem still exists. The problem's still there until we fix it. The problem's there, whether you see a symptom or not. It's when those symptoms go away keeping those people engaged and, and keeping them from becoming complacent is one of the real challenges. And that is where um, education comes in. That's where the the information that Steve has as a scientist, being able to put that out to as many people as possible in a, in a, a format that they can absorb and digest mm-hmm. so that they understand it. That's, that's if they understand that they have that education, they're going to be more likely to be engaged, whether there's symptoms in front of their face or not. So how do you, how, how do you plan on doing that, Steve? Well, I, I think that we, we, as Chris was saying, we have to use this as an education opportunity. We have to take advantage of it. And uh, to, to put this into our own personal perspective, if, if you have a heart attack, 
um, that's going to rock you. That's going to, to shake you to the core. And for most people, that's going to cause them to want to do something about it, take action, make changes in their eating and exercise. That The same thing is going on right now, not only in Florida Bay, but with the entire system, with these discharges and the problems that they're causing. Um, next year, things might be better. And we need to stay on top of this issue and say, we, we, you know, we're tracking the vital signs now of the Everglades. We have been for quite some time. We've got people's attention on this issue with red tide, with blue green algae, with seagrass die off in Florida Bay. We need to maintain that attention and that commitment to change. Even if things seem good next year or the next couple of years, we need to continue to educate and communicate that, yes, we're trending in a positive direction, but part of it might be just because we had the right amount of rainfall at the right time last year. And, yeah. and we know the benefits that that uh, gave us last year with the, the, the juvenile fish production and, and many of the mangrove creeks around the Everglades. That's not a sign of, of success with restoration. That just means the system has resilience. Right. And that we, if we stay on this path of restoration, we can have that nearly every year. Yeah, I think it would be um, more attractive to me to be painted a picture of, look, this is where we've come from. These are the steps that have been taken, and you're seeing significant improvement because of these. This out here. Let me paint this picture for you about how great this could be and how the whole state is going to benefit, not just, you know, fishing guides and their clients, but the entire state benefits from from a super healthy Everglades. That seems to me to be the challenge and maybe where where like what Benny's doing with your show of of painting that picture, not not just always talking about listen, these are the problems. This is, this is bad. All of this stuff is, is, is going wrong. Because I think that when, when, when you do that enough to a guy that's in middle America, he's just like, well, I'm just never going to go there, <laughs> right. you know? And, and I think that that is, that's really the challenge that, or one of the challenges, obviously there's, there's plenty of challenges, but to keep people engaged and to keep people to realize, wow, we, you know, we, we, knocked out that dike and put a bridge there and look at what has happened. It is a rebirth. And that, I mean, are, are, are we doing that effectively? Have, have there been places where there is such a, such a significant change that we're able to use that as a tool? Or, I mean, what are your thoughts on that, Steve? Well, I, I think we're on the cusp of being able to see those types of things. And um, there are restoration projects that fall outside of what we call the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan that have been in the works since the 1980s. And some of these projects are centered on Everglades National Park and will really change the way water flows uh, across Tamiami Trail. And so within the next year, uh, even having a one-mile bridge, and very soon we'll have water flowing under a two-and-a-half-mile bridge, uh, that alone will result in substantive changes that we can point to and say, mark my word, you're going to continue to see these kinds of benefits as we get closer to the coast, and it's because we've uh, improved the, the distribution pattern and quantity of flow going across Tamiami Trail. So there are projects that... that w- really within a year or two, we'll be able to point to and say it's because of these projects. And that's without new water coming from the north, from Lake Okeechobee. So as we can then build the projects that, uh, like the reservoir, that allow us to take a a sizable quantity of water and redirect it south, not only are we going to get benefits at that end of the system, we're going to see them in both the estuaries, the Clusatchee and the St. Lucie. So it, it, that's also a communications challenge for us to be able to say, you know, th- this is because of restoration. And it's not just the community. It's also the uh, elected officials that are appropriating right. the funds to do this. It's, it's our job to tell them, thank you. This is working, and and to give them updates yeah, to show on that. them that's money well spent. That's right. You know, yeah. it, this is an investment, is what it is. Um, and and I think there's also to to be able to show people that restoration works and that nature is very resilient. If you don't keep knocking it down time and time again, if you keep knocking it down, 
it's on a downward trend and, and you might have little periods of time where the conditions are right for it to rebound a little bit, but then it knocks down. And it's still, it's like a downward trend on a, on the stock market. You know, we need to start that upward trend to where the, the, the recovery phase is much longer than those phases where it takes those hits. Um, we're hopefully very soon here going to be able to, to see that directly with the case of Everglades restoration in, in some of these, these pieces of that system. But also, we know that it works because we've seen it in other places. You know, we've seen it with dam removal in many of the rivers throughout America. We've seen it in Chesapeake Bay. We know that restoration works, and we know that the, the, the natural system can and will recover just given the opportunity. Chris, in the, in the Everglades, you can, you can simply look back to 2017, referring to what uh, Dr. Davis just re- you know, said. We had a huge influx of fresh water in 17, two tropical systems, heavy rainfall. And what's happened? Every single guide in Everglades National Park is talking about all the little redfish and snook and mm-hmm. trout that are everywhere. Um, that's Mother Nature saying, hey, 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 I need fresh water. Just give me fresh water and this is what I can do. Um, I mean, I'm sure it's not just that, but, but yeah. it's, it's a, that's a, a red fl- I mean, it's a, a please help me red flag from Mother Nature. But then we're also able to, I mean, that's a great example of being able to see that Mother Nature helped itself out and look at what's happening. There are thousands of of 12 to 14 inch redfish all over the place. Everybody's catching them, right? But that is because mostly of rainfall. Now, if we can, you know, we open a couple of of dikes and, and have more water flowing south, then you can see that that we are allowing it to happen. And then all of a sudden it's, it's bountiful beyond our wildest imaginations. Sure. It's about hope. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's one thing to fight for something that you may not believe is going to happen, but the reality is she showed us that if, if we give her water, she will rebound. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the question about those fish, those little, that little broodstock that is that, that little uh, recruit class that's happened from 2017 is, is there enough, estuary is there enough forage area for them to survive now with all of our grass die off and all our issues that we have right now and and i'm i'm quite i question that but if we just look at the fact that we had a huge influx of babies that were produced in just one year of of good water flow what what could possibly happen if we fix the water right i mean my opinion is it'll be better than anyone's ever seen in this lifetime and if if there's anything to hang your hat on to to have hope, that's it. Now I I, I believe that too, and I, I I believe that it can be beyond anyone's wildest dreams. Um, the populations of every fish there can can go through the roof. But I think that, in my opinion, the way that you you know our you as a fishing guide need to continue to educate your your people and show them that look at all these little fish this is because this happened and this is where we're going this is because it happened and this is where we're going but in order to to lead up and down the chain that's leading down the chain of you know to your your customers to lead up the chain is to be be talking all the way to the governor level of look this has happened and this is the financial difference in the state of Florida. I mean, because you opened these things up and spent $5 million, $10 million here, look at all these businesses just flourishing. Look at the real estate values going through the roof. Look at this now double down. Like, I mean, he's got two and a half billion dollars to spend, but, but that can be more of a focus of, I think that when, when people see, wow, look at, there's new businesses opening, there's all this stuff. And, and you bring it back to a, to a financial thing that, that anyone anywhere in Florida can, can be like the economy is cranking. Right. You know, something that is, um, all these things kind of share a trend is, is whether you're talking about economic recovery or ecological recovery, um, the 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 growth or the loss is exponential um you know we're as these systems begin to to heal and recover their recovery is is greater and greater every year the longer they recover um and 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 our economy follow that as we know these things affect our economy so as our 
as these as these systems can recover, it spurs more business, and that business compounds. Um, and and it's the same thing. It can it can go either way. You know, look, we're talking about one system that was broken up into multiple separate systems, and that the the the, the position we're in today with these catastrophes that happen didn't just happen the day that those systems were were separated it's the longer that that decline happens the faster the decline happens and the recovery will be the same way that the 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 more the longer that that we put those systems back into recovery the faster the recovery is going to happen um and and our economy is going to follow the the ecology so as as our systems become healthy and and recover our economy will will directly benefit from that and and that's the reality of what our policymakers listen mm-hmm. to right. you know we can go out there and say yeah. there's all these fish there's more fish but the other important thing is is that's the value to people like Steve of of fishermen being canaries in the coal mine is he can say hey in this year Benny can go in this year all of us guides saw all of these new hatchling fish. And Steve can look at that from a science perspective and say, well, this, what happened during this year scientifically that was unique. And you say, well, that was when we had a ton of rain. So we gave these systems water that they hadn't been getting. And here was the result. uh, Reconfirming that these systems, that what the science is telling us is these systems use water and what the boots on the ground are telling us are the exact same thing. Mm-hmm. And to just add a, a little finer point to that from the science perspective, we have modeling tools that we have developed over years that are come out of our, our years of observations. And we would have predicted this, knowing that amount of freshwater flow uh, that we had uh, in late 2016 into 2017 um, knowing that amount of freshwater flow, we would have predicted uh, a bumper crop of, of juvenile fish. We also saw at the beginning of last year, um, and that's the year I was referring to, I'm, we're in 2019 now, uh, <laughs> in, in 2018, we also saw a record, uh, period of record nesting uh, season for wading birds across the Everglades. And that is something that we also have modeling tools that we use, and they would have predicted that. So if we had, you know, in in a simulation world, the ability to flow that amount of water through the system at that time, and what restoration allows us is the tools to do that, if we could flow that amount of water, not only can we produce more fish, we can also produce more wading birds. The system really has that level of resilience built in. Uh, what we hope is that it's not too late when we complete restoration that that resilience maybe is lost. Right. But now we're still seeing it, and so we're hopeful that as we continue to progress and and based on our observations, based on our models, that we'll see exactly what we would have predicted. You know, it's it's unique, Tom. Three years ago, when when we were just starting Captains for Clean Water, it you know we we kind of started doing this thing in late February, and uh, I cast of that year, which is what July, you know, we're up there and we're, we're trying to drum up support from the fishing industry. And we came to people like you, um, who, you know, leaders, uh, in the industry that have a connection from the businesses and the companies that make up the industry to the end user and, and the fishermen. Um, we came to, to, to folks like you to make a video It was the first video we ever made. We had all, you know, you and Flip and all, all the people that, you know, folks like myself look up to and, and many others. And one of the sentences in that video, first thing we ever made was, we must listen to what science is telling us or to what nature is showing us and what science is telling us. And, and that's still today, three years later, what we're saying. And they go hand in hand. You know, what, what science is telling us is the same exact thing that nature shows us. And if you look at them together from the aspect through the eyes of a fishing guide and through the eyes of a scientist, they show you the same thing. They, they reinforce the, the statement that we're, we're on the right track 
there's um, the the faster we can get these things done, the the faster we're going to see a benefit. Yeah, I, I don't doubt that at all. That that people that love the Everglades and are moving in a direction of restoring the Everglades have science that supports what they say. On the other hand, you could have special interest groups that are also using science science to support what they want. And that's where it gets really confusing to a lawmaker and really confusing to someone who's saying, I don't know what the right thing is because these people, it's a huge industry in Florida. And here's some science that says if we inject water 3000 feet deep, that this is going to be fine. And here's some other science over here that says, no, this is a horrible thing. And what we really need to do is this. So like Steve, how does that, how does, how does that kind of information and that kind of conflicting science um, get assimilated at the, at the level of where it really makes a difference? Well, I think for, for most people, and we'll just say for the sake of simplicity, non-scientists, I, I think the, the most logical approach is the smell test. And for me, the smell test has gotten me to where I am in my life. It's, it, it, you know, that, that's the test that says, hmm, you know, what do I really think about this? What, what's this person saying? What's their agenda? What, how does that sort of mesh with what the majority of other people are saying? And so th- I, I think that's sort of the first step to really understanding what might be a hidden agenda. Now, you're saying uh, that as a scientist, but do you think that people who are non-scientists and are responsible for making laws are, are using that same smell test? Well, I, so you, you mentioned deep well injection. Let's, let's take that as an example, um, because I, I think it's a great example of how you have uh, opposite sides on an issue like this. Um, where there's a group saying, well, if we just injected it into the ground, that would, that would solve our problem. Um, in many ways, that's the same kind of thinking that led to this water infrastructure that we have, yep. uh, that's causing all of these problems. And those problems are unintended consequences of an action that was really implemented over half century ago. So with deep well injection, we've got sort of a a similar kind of mindset. Let's get rid of the water. That will solve our problems. Um, And we don't have any science currently, you know, that can say definitively, this is what's going to happen. Uh, But I assure you, down the road, when you're talking about injecting the volume of Lake Okeechobee 3,000 feet into the ground, we're going to realize unintended consequences of that. One is the fact that we're not sending that water south to where it absolutely needs to go. Um, another thing is that we're wasting a precious resource, fresh water. Uh, and, and on a scale that, you know, just boggles the mind that, that we would need to be able to get rid of um, and so you think about other well, states hand, and other regions that need fresh water. Right. So it, w- when you start weighing all of these things, and it doesn't take a scientist to weigh that, I, I think you can start to question intent. Um, and, and it, you know, it's also about investing money and being wise with those investments. If you can get dual benefits from an investment, um, reducing discharges and sending water south, why would you invest in something else? that only gets rid of the water right. and doesn't provide. So it, it, again, it, I, I'm not saying that it takes a, a you know, technical understanding. I, I think that most people can sort of discern, you know, fact from fiction, from spin on their own. And then it, if they're interested, they can certainly seek uh, a more technical understanding to get feedback. And um, the more people you talk to, I think people get a consensus on this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's just, uh, you know, I can, I can believe that there's a lot of people that can get the consensus, but it's the, it's the few people that actually make the policy that, that are the ones that, you know, do they, are they doing what you're saying? I don't know. It just doesn't seem like it's ever a good idea to me. And I'm no scientist by any stretch of the imagination, 
but it never seems like you can shortcut nature and benefit. Like putting the water directly into the aquifer, that doesn't seem like a good idea because there was a natural process for it to get in there. If you could just try to replicate that natural process, that seems like the <laughs> safest, easiest, cheapest way Common to go. Common sense. Right. Seems like, seems like it. But then somebody else, I mean, I, can, I could see the arguments. Like this was all new to me just earlier today, sure. like the deep water injections. But I could see arguments. Like when I started thinking about it, I was like, well, you dump all that water in those holes and it doesn't go to the beaches. So problem right. solved. Well, and, and, and problem and created. It comes back again to us uh, raising the level of understanding and education on these issues and on the solutions to as many people as possible. That's Benny's job as a fishing guide, other than you know, give, creating an attachment and, and appreciation for these places. Um, that's Steve's job as a scientist. That's my job as an activist, is to raise the level of understanding and education. Because if you do that, and people have even a 30,000-foot view of, of what these problems are and what the solutions are, you get them looking at the solutions um, system-wide, outside of just their bubble of where they live. Mm -hmm. And by doing so, the common sense part can come in to weigh whether or not a proposed solution is a good idea or not a good idea, whether or not it's beneficial, beneficial, whether, whether or not we get the biggest bang for our buck as taxpayers, if we're looking at it from a policymaker's point of view. And, and part of our education is not just educating the public, it's educating our policymakers. Of course. They're disconnected from this. One of the biggest things they that we've been able to- They've got a lot of things going they on. Have they a, got people exactly, knocking on the door. It's, it's a constant flow of people in and out of those offices. That's, that's why it's important for us to-, to stay very singular and focus on these things. If, if we were to go into a policymaker's office with 50 different things, we wanted it's the chance of getting all 50 of those things or any one of them is, is slim. If we go in there and say, this is the most important thing right now, we want this. And then we're going to, we're going to, as, as Chris Peterson from Hell's Base says, we're talking about eating an elephant and we're going to do it one bite at a time. And, and that's the way you do it. Um, th that's the key. Because if, if I looked at, Deep well injection, for example, regionally from my bubble where I live and spend, you know, 300 days a year in Fort Myers, I could come to the conclusion, well, deep well injection might help my area. But if I had a better understanding of the system and I looked at it as a system wide, I say, wait a minute, that's, that's not a good idea because that water that Everglades and Florida Bay is starving to get that we know is beneficial based on you know, what Benny sees as a fishing guide when we get water to those areas based on what Steve sees as a scientist when his modeling or when he, when he monitors these different things when we get water there, that, that water, by throwing it away underground, is, is not helping the bottom part of the system. So, okay, common sense wise then says, well, that doesn't seem like a very good option. And then if I look at it from a policymaker's point of view and in how – what what return on investment am I going to get for for the taxpayer dollar? Am I going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to throw water away to benefit this one little part of this of the region or the system, or could I could I put that same hundreds of millions of dollars into solutions that are going to have a benefit to the system as a whole? And then it, it's easy to to kind of if you start looking at things like that, it's easy to determine what is a, a good idea with a high return on investment or a, a bad idea with not. But, but it all comes back to peeping, people having a little bit higher level of understanding mm -hmm. yeah. of the system in order to, to, get, to go walk themselves through those processes. That, that's stated much more eloquently. than, than <laughs> <laughs> And I think what it comes down to is frame the question as, is it restoration? Or is it uh, this path Reaction. of continually sweeping the problem under the rug? So that, that question maybe needs to be, is it restoration? It seems like our, our, <clears throat> our job as people sitting around this table is to continue to lead the politicians so that that small group that you were just referring to, that whatever solution, whether it's the deep well injections or it's some other solution, these people might have lobbyists, they might have 
they may be very powerful and they may have a very loud voice. And so if you can satisfy them, well, you're not going to hear from all these other people. So a lot of policies are probably made like that, right? So our job is to continue to lead that all of the politicians and all of the people that were, are responsible that, look, just because you're not hearing from these people doesn't mean that they're not responsible for billions of dollars in this economy. And then what I've always liked about what you guys have done from, from day one, when the first time I got on your website, is it all came back to an economic benefit like and an economic issue. Like This isn't a water issue. This isn't a redfish issue or a snook issue. You're only going to get this many people interested That's in right. that. But when you can bring it down to an economic thing for the entire state of Florida to where realtors and restaurants and, and tour guides and, and air, you know, airports and everybody is interested in this issue when it is an economic issue based you know, to the level that it is, billions and billions of dollars. And that, I think, needs to remain a focus as to, you know, when we're seeing these benefits, showing the, the, uh, the leadership. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think that th- there's been a tremendous amount of progress uh, in, the, in the past couple of years getting more people involved. But there's also been, bec- as a result of the water crisis the last couple of years, there has been... It, there, um, a con- the consequence of that is we've seen the economic impact in a negative. Okay, you, you, we can measure the benefit in a positive, and we can measure the the the, ben- the 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 impact in a negative. And we've seen the impact uh, <laughs> negatively the last few years, and that's measurable. It's quantifiable. You know, we, there's there's impact reports that just on Sanibel Island where I grew up. Uh, you know, in a, I think it was a, a 60 day time period, there was f- 40 plus million dollars lost in revenue um, because of poor water quality. And as a result of that, we can take those figures to our policymakers. We can take that impact to our policymakers. We can do that um, through tools on our website with with being able to to email and message our policymakers. We can do that by going and physically standing in their office and bringing, you know, four or five representatives of, of different industries uh, there to tell their story, you know, which, which we've, we've done in the past. And it's very effective because, you know, if I go in there and we, and we set up and we go meet with the governor um, or a senator, whoever it may be, and, and we have a, a realtor and we have a, a restaurant owner and we have a fishing guide and a marina owner and a boat builder and a, uh, you know, a cooler manufacturer from Texas, all saying this is impacting our business. That's very measurable, and and that carries a lot more weight than a special interest group and a lobbyist making campaign donations. It's a matter of of it has to be scaled. It has to be big, um, but. The, the the power of the public and the people when engaged is much much more powerful than the power of of special interests. Proven this week, Chris. Proven this week. <laughs> Hard evidence, black and white. We we fought. We all fought this last election to make this the issue, and it became the issue. And the special interests, the people they wanted to be in office, were voted out power of the people is more is more powerful than the money and in special interest and we've proven that this week I mean governor if we continue to make this a priority and we continue to feed him with the correct factual information then we have a serious shot at making this right so super exciting i think so in in everyone's opinion what what now like what what's next what do we do got to keep the heat on yeah, um, we're we're going to hold policymakers accountable for for what we know needs to be done, for what science says needs to be done. Um, as a community, uh, we need to continue to grow and and do what we've done in the last couple of years here. Um, when when I call you up and say, Tom, I need you to 
send, you know, go on the website and send an email to your representative. We need it to have be programmed in your mind that, that you do that to 10 other people. And, um, and we need to keep that, that effort of, of the people being engaged growing. We need more people to have an understanding and appreciation, uh, f- for these issues, um, so that they they see restoration as an investment in the future of their way of life, in the future of their economy. And the way to do that is is simply by keeping the conversation going, you know, encouraging people to become a member of Captains for Clean Water so that we can feed you that information as it happens. Um, and we can call on you uh, to make your voice heard when when it's needed, you know, we're very realistic that people have busy lives that they that they lead. They've got a lot going on. It's not realistic to think that the populace as a whole or the majority are going to be able to keep tabs on everything that's going on with policy and these decisions with Everglades restoration on their own. It's just absolutely not realistic. Special interest actually relies on that fact yeah. that the people will become complacent. Um, what we can do as an organization is keep people fed with that information and activate them when they need to be activated and educate them on on what's happening, whether it's good or bad, when it's happening. And that's, I think, the the biggest responsibility that we have at Captains for Clean Water is keeping that line of communication open, encouraging people to be a member so that you know you're on our email list that you are aware of, of, of wins and you're aware of threats. And I think if, if we all make a concerted effort to increase the amount of people that are aware of this and talk about it um, and get more people engaged, that we're going to continue to see progress being made um, that ultimately 50 years or 100 years from now, we're, ta- you know, we're talking about decisions and actions that were made 50 years ago 50 years from now, the people are going to be talking about the decisions or actions that we are happening and making today. So we, you know, it comes down to what is going to be the future that we leave? What's, what is our legacy going to be? Are we going to let that legacy be determined by special interests and bureaucrats? Or are we going to determine our legacy? Yep. And Benny, what do you think as as a as a, as far as a, a fishing guide? As say you're the representative voice for the fishing guides. What do what do fishing guides do with their clients that they have captive on their boat for eight hours a day? <laughs> so I, I I would keep it positive. Um, I would keep it um, factual and um, encourage encouraging to get involved. Um, and um, I think if you could do those three things while you're having a day on the water, that it becomes an organic sell um, because no one wants to be sold anything. And, um, and certainly you don't want the people to leave thinking, wow, that was a big problem. I don't want to go back there. So mm-hmm. you have to stay positive. Um, you have to be factual and try to encourage them to get involved. And if you can do those three things, it's a huge success. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've been doing that for the last three years. And I, I tell you that my, my clients are of the most – engaged in getting this solved because they want to continue to fish where we fish and it's the easiest sell you're gonna have Mm -hmm. i mean these are people paying money to go fish in the area that we're trying to save right they have they are physically investing in that area right on that day so if you give them the opportunity to get involved give them the right information to share with their people then it's a huge win in your side. Yeah, and of course if you can if you can influence the other fishing guides to do the same thing and and ed- educate them so that they have the same information then you're then you're exponentially increasing that number of people. We have a, right. we have an uphill battle with 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 fishing guides in the state. There's no doubt because uh there uh, at least half of them understand this is the this is a problem and they're in, they're engaged and and the result is what we've the successes the successes we've seen in the last 3 years. But there are several of them that are still stuck in the day-to-day, like we discussed earlier, they don't understand that their fishery is attached to the, the, the entire fishery issues in the state of, state of Florida. And they don't want, for example, a guy in Duck Key may not want Chris to talk about red tide. 
because it may affect his business. Yeah. Right. And I understand that. We, we understand that. But the reality is our fisheries are tied to his, his are tied to ours. And if we don't start looking at it as a big picture, then we're, then we're giving it up to special interests. So we have to start fighting together. We have to stop thinking about the day-to-day stuff. We have to start thinking big picture and get involved in this fight in every way we can. Mm-hmm. Steve, thoughts? Well, I'll, I'll give uh, the perspective of a scientist. And um, I recognized a long time ago that publishing papers and you know generating new scientific information, that's incredibly valuable, but that doesn't get restoration projects built. Um, and using kind of a football analogy, it, it might get us to the red zone, but it takes experts in communications, experts in policy, experts in advocacy to really get us across the goal line. And I, I, I think that there's no shortage of science. We're going to continue to generate new information and hone what we've got. Uh, it's always important to continually monitor and track the vital signs of the greater Everglades so I'm not saying we don't need any more science. We absolutely do. But at this point, we need to continue the pressure at the political level and continually educate the public on this issue. They need to know why it's important. And so that's how we're going to get this done. Right on. All right. So uh, if somebody wants to, to be part of your group, how would they do it? Well, we're not a member organization, okay. but they can certainly draw upon the resources that we have available. Um, I educate and, and brief a number of groups. Uh, we take folks out on Florida Bay. We take them on tours of, uh, you know, on an airboat of the Everglades. And the whole point is education and outreach on this issue. Uh, if they would like to learn more about us, uh, evergladesfoundation.org is our website. We're active on social media as well, so you can find us there. And um, feel free to give me a call. I'm, I'm always happy to, to talk to folks about these places that I love. Very good. And Benny, Tell how do people contact you? Um, I'm easy. <laughs> um, any, any search on the internet, you can find me in five seconds. Um, but I wanted to go back to what, what Stephen just said and something you touched on earlier. Um, Everglazefoundation.org is one of the places you can go to get the real facts. So if you're doing a smell test on some information that you find on the internet and you want to know if it's real, there's one place you can go right away. CapturedCleanWater.org is another one. It's, a, it's important that we, as leaders in the industry, identify those areas where it's safe to go get information. And so um, this is an excellent opportunity for us to, to relay, relay that information. Rather than call me to go fishing, go look up EvergladesFoundation.org, CaptainsForCleanWater.org, get the right information. I think that's as important of a message as we can share today. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then go fishing. And then go yeah. fishing. <laughs> yeah, and see, see what it's all about. You know, um, I, I had Daniel on a show. And, uh, that show it's, it's out, it's on waypoint TV right now. Um, but we had a wonderful day. We went, um, up to Sandy key and, and, um, we saw all manner of things. They're beautiful bird life. It was a wonderful day going out there. It was a beautiful sunrise. We get there, we catch crazy things like a small hammerhead shark and all other kinds of other sharks and all kinds of jacks and then the tarpon show up and then it slicks off and their permit up there just floating in that channel and and we catch those too and the whole day you know just when we were putting the show together the whole day was just just a reminder to me of just how great what we have is even today even with all of the discussion that we have of the problems and the the quality issues and the plumbing issues and everything else what exists right there right now you could leave out of this dock right now and go run across there and you can have a a wonderful day and to me that was it was just so important on that day to see that because it was super positive and it was like daniel did a great job of just saying look man look at how great it is and think about how great it could be like beyond your wildest imaginations. Yeah. And, uh, you know, again, I just want to thank each one of you guys uh, for the work that you're doing because you're, you're doing the work of the masses. You really are. And, and Chris, your, your organization has done a great job of being this leadership in the fishing industry. And the fishing industry is a very, very important industry, not just economically, but 
you know, there's a lot of really smart people and a lot of really outspoken people. And a lot of these people have platforms that reach tremendous amounts of people, whether that's radio shows or podcasts or television shows or so just just fishing guides with social media accounts. You we now have so many people at our disposal um, that we can contact with whatever message it is that that they want. I encourage all the fishing guys that listen to this podcast to be part of Captains for Clean Water. And if they wanted to do that, what where where do they go and what do they do? Yeah, uh, very simple. Visit captainsforcleanwater.org um, and you can go on there, take action. You can become a member. You can watch videos. You can learn more about what we're doing as an organization, what our efforts are, and, and you can learn about, um, you know, folks like Steve and, and, and what needs to be done. But there's a lot of, a lot of resources there. Um, we make it as, as simple as, as possible. Everything we do, we look at as, as trying to appeal to ourselves, you know, as fishermen. And um, so we, we try to make those experiences fast and easy but well the fastest and easiest the thing was there there was a there was something that went out not too long ago and there needed to be a letter sent to your your senator or congressman and you went on there and literally i timed myself and it was less than 30 seconds i had done that because when you tell somebody that you're like oh, you know what the address is or this or that and there's all these excuses but to go there and you see click 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 Sign done, and yeah. it went to who whoever it was supposed to. Took the thought completely out of it. The letter was perfectly prepared. You read it, and it's like, yeah, that's what that's. Those are my concerns, right? And I'm putting my name on this, and boom, and literally within 30 seconds. And I think that's another reason why you're being very, very effective. Is not only are you keeping it positive, but you're keeping it very simple, and you're keeping the messages that you need people to act on. Very, very simple, and 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 it's a very easy call to action rather than, you know, too many things. I think it's the one bite at a time, like you said. Right. That's that's a great way to to go and a great way to keep it keep it going. Yeah, we're you know we we just try to make it to where it's easy for you to do in between you know work and picking up kids and taking. <laughs> there's all these things, and and we just look at ourselves and is it realistic? We, we know we need people in this instance to, to email their, their representatives. Is it realistic to just say, hey, email your representative? Right. No. But with the, the tools we have at our disposal today to get the message out that there's that need through social media, um, through television, things like that, you know, just with one R1 organization, we could reach 6 million people a month with messaging. Um, if you can then, you can reach them with that and then you can facilitate it to where it's easy for them to to make those uh, actions happen um that's something we didn't have a decade mm -hmm. ago mm -hmm. and i think that's a, a real big reason of 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 why we're able to scale up our effectiveness as as just citizens is you know we can spread message now like wildfire very efficiently very fast um that's a key we're we're, we're using that it's proven that it's effective but uh Ultimately, it comes down to each and every one of us, um, not only doing it ourselves, but encouraging as many other people as we can to do so as well. All right. Well, we'll keep doing our best. I appreciate all, all that all of you guys are doing. Thank you, and, Tom. Uh, Thank you. We will, we will do this again very soon and find out. I'd like to find out all the victories that have happened since, since today in about maybe six months a year. Absolutely. Big victories. All right. Thank you. Thank you to Benny, Chris, and Steve for all of your work. It is so great to have leaders like you that uh, really are doing all of this work for all of us. The Everglades is a super important place, and it is, like we mentioned in the in the podcast, it's the heartbeat. It's the heartbeat of Florida, and it's so important. If you're not involved in this fight, get educated. Go to the resources of the Everglades Foundation to Captains for Clean Water. Uh, educate yourself, listen to the other podcasts, watch the other shows that they've done, and it's important to you. Take some action. All right, if you want to take other action, it'd be much appreciated if you go to iTunes and leave a rating and review for this show. I'd really like that. If you're really feeling great, send me an email, podcast at Saltwater Experience. Tell me what you think about the show. Send me some guest suggestions. I promise I will try to 
track them down. I've got some great shows lined up for 2019, and I'm excited to hear who else you want me to talk to. All right, until next week, see ya.